Hello, I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation on Pragmatic Adoption of Requisite Pro. My name is Bill Nazaro, and I'm the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for ICON ATG. Over the past several years of working with our clients, we've found that Microsoft Word, Excel, or even email work satisfactory for capturing and expressing our clients' requirements. While this approach may be successful for the smallest of projects, as size and complexity increase, we found that more difficult for our clients to socialize requirements, more difficult to gain a monitor acceptance of the requirements, and more difficult to track their interdependencies. Additionally, to meet the challenges of modern day projects like increased project complexity, geographical dispersion of teams, and the rate at which our requirements change to meet the ever-changing market, we need a tool that will help us seamlessly facilitate the capture and management of our requirements. In this talk, we will discuss how your requirements can be optimally transitioned to Requisite Pro and how you can maximize the capabilities of the tool within your organization to meet these challenges. Our agenda for this presentation is as follows. First, we'll have a brief overview of requirements management, where we'll discuss why we need to focus on requirements and why managing our requirements is so important. Then we'll discuss the common mistakes that clients make when adopting tools, followed by several useful and pragmatic tips when adopting Requisite Pro within your organization. So let's get started. In this section, we'll have a brief overview of requirements management, discuss why there's such a tremendous focus on requirements within our industry, and why managing requirements is important for our projects to be successful. Why the focus on requirements? Unfortunately, we have probably all experienced projects exceeding budgets, deadlines, or even abandoned midway through the project. Or we may have completed the project as originally specified, but our customers are not finding our solutions valuable because their needs have changed from the time we captured the requirements and embarked upon building the system to when we actually delivered it to them. Over the years, numerous studies have been conducted to try to determine why IT is not successfully delivering projects. A rather infamous and often referenced survey called the Chaos Report, conducted by the Standish Group every two years since 1994, has continually listed incomplete requirements and lack of user involvement as the top factors most frequently contributing to project failures. In 1995, Application Development Trends magazine had an art article called the, the Dollar Drain of IT Project Failures, which referenced the 1994 Chaos Report and concluded that the top two reasons projects were canceled were incomplete requirements and lack of user involvement. Additionally, they surveyed why projects succeed, and among the top four reasons were user involvement and clear requirements. In the 2004 Chaos Report entitled Chaos Chronicles, they found that less than half the requested features that our customers originally requested actually made it into their product and found total U.S. project waste to be $55 billion, made up of $38 billion in lost dollar value and $17 billion in cost overruns. On a relatively positive note, the 10th edition of the annual Chaos Report from Standish Group released in 2004 indicated that project success rates have increased to 34% of all projects. That's more than 100% improvement from the success rate found in the first study in 1994. When asked for the chief reasons for the success rates and why they've improved, Stannis Chairman Jim Johnson said the primary reason is the projects have gotten a lot smaller, doing projects with iterative processing as opposed to waterfall method which call for all project requirements to be defined up front is a major step forward. I actually believe that this is a very important point. Because when I say we need to uh, focus on requirements, I'm not condoning a waterfall mentality of gathering all the requirements up front and freezing them. Rather, I'm condoning the elicitation and capturing of requirements within iterations or sprints. I'm also expressing a need for a lightweight, highly responsive change management program that allows us to be able to be adapted to our customers' changing needs, while at the same time understanding the impact to the iteration, sprint, or overall project. Why is managing requirements important? If we agree with the Standish Group's findings that we need complete and clear requirements, I'd like to also add one more item to this list, which is concise requirements. With complete, clear, concise requirements in hand, we then shift to managing those requirements. Many of us are faced with the reality of having to do more with fewer resources, increased decentralization of our organization across numerous time zones, project delivery within smaller time frames, and the need to get it right the first time to meet market demands or take advantage of a market opportunity. Successful projects must be delivered on time, within budget, and I believe most importantly address the client's needs. Managing requirements can help us control complex, highly iterative projects, can improve software quality because we'll have a benchmark to write our test cases against, can cut project costs and delays because we gain visibility into what's being requested and built within an iteration or project, and it can help improve communication and compliance because we'll have a central requirement repository available for all involved in the project. IBM's Requisite Pro offers a powerful, easy-to-use requirements management tool that helps teams manage project requirements 
promote communication and collaboration amongst the team members, and reduce project risk. REC Pro offers the power of a database and tight integration with Microsoft Word. Its architecture maintains live requirement documents that are dynamically linked to a database for powerful sort and query capabilities. This allows you to easily organize and prioritize your requirements, to trace relationships between them, and track changes that affect them. Robust traceability features visually indicate how changes affect the project, thereby giving you the ability to perform real-time impact analysis and allowing you to make informed decisions for scope management or resource allocation. As a result, you are better able to manage requirement change and your project is less likely to spiral off course. REC Pro captures change history for each requirement, thereby providing a paper audit of the uh, evolution of project requirements. REC Pro is integrated with other Rational Suite products. All the products in the Rational Suite family are team unifying tools and include additional role specific tools to optimize each suite for the individual practitioner. I've enclosed some brief definitions to assure clarity as we go forward. A requirement may be simply defined as a capability that a system must provide. Requirements management may be simply defined as a systematic approach to eliciting, organizing, and documenting the requirements of a system or a process that establishes and maintains agreement of the system's requirements between the customer and the project team. There are numerous other definitions that do exist for requirements and requirements management, but we'll use these as our baseline for going forward. So where are we? In this section, we'll have a brief discussion on the common tool adoption mistakes that organizations make when rolling out a new tool. Common tool adoption mistakes. The first one on my list is lack of tool education and experience. Many of us purchase a tool and then employ on-the-job training, or let's just get started with it and figure it out as we go along. Unfortunately, these approaches usually lead to shelfware syndrome. This is where we purchase the tool never really learn how to use it, and then we either stop using it or use a fraction of the tool's true capabilities. If you're going to purchase a tool for your organization, you really need to also invest in training your people on how to use it. The second item is not determining impact to your network. Many of the tools we purchase have underlying databases to retain our data. One must consider where they install their tools and the number of hops required to access the tool's data. At one particular company, we had installed our version control and defect tracking tool in our data center. However, the primary users, nearly 90%, were located in another building and we had limited bandwidth between the two buildings. The development team's performance was adversely impacted whenever we did code check-in, code check-out, and builds. We had builds running for hours. We had initially attributed this to the tool and we were not really that happy with the tool suite. After some conversation with the vendor's help desk and reading forms, we decided to redeploy the product at our building to see how it would perform. The same build that had run for hours across the network now took less than 20 minutes. So determining your network topology and how the tool should live within your network should really not be an afterthought. The third item is not properly estimating the number of required licenses. So how many licenses will you require? Tool vendors will often suggest that you buy a license for every user of the tool. Depending upon the tool, this may or may not be the case. For example, if purchasing an IDE, you'll probably want to buy a license for each developer. If you're purchasing a requirements management tool, you may need a license for each business analyst, or you may want to estimate the usage and buy licenses based on your usage patterns. You also want to understand how you may share requirements or publish requirements for review to the user community prior to buying licenses. You need to understand the vendor's licensing strategy and your potential usage patterns. You, and I really want to stress you, have to make the decision about the number of licenses to buy, not the vendor. The fourth item is misaligning tools with your offshore vendor. So you decided to offshore your development but still retain business analysis and project management onshore. Have you considered what tool your offshore vendor is using? The larger offshore vendors will say that they have licenses for many of the tools, and most do. But I want to know about their education and experience with the tools. Which ones are they comfortable with? What IDE are they using for development? What testing tool are they using? Additionally, many of the tool vendors are espousing open application lifecycle management, but how seamlessly will they integrate? Do we have to create an integration between our requirements management tool and our testing tool if they're from different vendors? If you're about to purchase a requirements management tool, for example, and you're in the beginning or currently underway with offshore development, you should also gather the requirements from your offshore vendor regarding their needs and interoperability. The last item on my list we're going to talk about in more detail on the next slide, and that's misunderstanding the tool's philosophy and intent.